of the Oregon Building Performance Standards Rulemaking Advisory Committee. Um, thanks for logging in. We'll get started here in a minute or two after a few more folks uh, join. Hey there, everyone. Looks like a few more folks are logging in. Um, thanks for joining. This is Blake Shalid. In a minute here, we'll get started with the rulemaking advisory committee meeting for our building performance standards program. Um, and let's see. In the meantime, let's see. I think since it's officially summer now, um, as just like a fun kind of kickoff, why don't you go ahead and put in the chat, you know, in addition to your name and who you represent, um, something you're looking forward to this summer. Um, whether it's a vacation or a trip or an activity, um, something like that. Um, so I'll go ahead and start. I am looking forward to spending lots of time with my kids at the neighborhood pool. We have a pool just a couple blocks away from us, so we often spend evenings and weekends there. It's a nice, nice little break. All right, it looks like we've got kind of a, a good a good number of folks already logged in, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, but I don't think we need to go through and do introductions now that we're on our third or fourth meeting. Um, but we'll just kind of kick it off uh, going through the agenda. Um, ask for any comments if there's any kind of changes or recommendations to the agenda, and um, and then we'll kind of get dig into the rules. So today we were uh, planning to go over the next three chapters of ASHRAE Standard 100. Those are chapters 7, 8, and 9. To chapter 7's talking about the energy use and greenhouse gas emissions analysis and target requirements. And um, just as a reminder, we're, we're still um, going through that process of actually setting what the targets are, but we're going to go through the language in chapter 7 that just talks about like how you determine your target, especially for buildings that have multiple type of uses and how you look at like a weighted, weighted average for those sort of buildings. Um, but we're not getting into actual discussion of those EUI targets today. Um, we're, we're, we finalized the contract with a consultant, SBW, to do that work. Um, we've got a kickoff meeting with them um, here coming up shortly, and then we'll be scheduling a series of meetings with the RAC and public meetings to actually talk about that methodology and those targets and the average energy use um, soon, but not, uh, not on the agenda today to talk about what those actual targets are themselves. Um, and then chapter eight goes over the energy audit and decarbonization assessment requirements. And chapter nine goes into the implementation and verification requirements. So we'll work through those draft rules. And then also today we wanted to get into draft language for the investment criteria pathway. Um, so the investment criteria pathway is the pathway for compliance for buildings that um, you know, either don't have a target and they need to do an audit, identify measures, and then implement the measures that are cost effective as a bundle. Um, or it's also a pathway for buildings that do have a target to, to document those, those measures um, and the ability to try to get down to those measures, but also it provides the, some guidelines and side rails on cost effectiveness um, for a potential compliance path. And then hoping, hoping to have time toward the end um, to also talk about the energy data aggregation um, piece of our potential piece of our rulemaking um, that talks about like how utilities and building owners can aggregate data for buildings with multiple meters. Um, so that's something that I think we, we need to kind of work through a little bit, um, hoping for some input from the rack on that. Um, and then also, if there's time too, we wanted to get into the, the concept of campus buildings. Um, and how those can potentially be considered and, and addressed or should be considered and addressed within the, the scope of our rules. And a couple of those items might extend on to the next meeting, but hoping to get kind of a start start there. So. And I'm loving seeing these uh, activities here in the in the chat. That's great. Looks like a lot of folks have 
some exciting things coming up this summer. So, um, all right, with that, after having, oh, I guess, uh, um, are there any um, from the RAC members, any potential like changes or modifications to the agenda? All right, not not hearing any, so we'll we'll proceed um, as laid out. Uh, so all, I'm going to pull up the draft rules here, um, and we'll just start with Chapter Seven here. Um, so again, I've tried just to kind of explain the changes in the side sideline comments. Um, let me make this a little bit bigger too. I recognize it's probably not seen. How was that? Is that is that okay? Hopefully, the folks can kind of see that. Um, so, uh, chapter seven talks about the energy use of greenhouse gas emissions analysis and target requirements, and it starts out by basically explaining. Okay, buildings are divided into these activity types, as shown in table seven point one. Um, we've replaced table seven point one in ASHRAE standard one hundred with with a new table that um, has more building classifications that's based upon the Energy Star Portfolio Manager list of building classifications. So that's the way that um, it was done in, in Washington State, and that's the way that we're approaching developing our building occupancy types and classifications. Um, and we'll have targets developed for each one of those building types too. So, you know, eventually we'll have this uh, table of activities, uh, activity types in 7.1, and then the targets in table 7.2. Um, so um, we've this table 7.3. Um, we crossed that one out because that one is applicable for source energy. Um, our energy EUI targets will be based on site energy usage. Um, so that that um, pretty much most of the changes to this section um, that and really emissions or uh, like edits and, and deletions to chapter seven that we've made are to reflect the fact that Oregon's BPS is based on only site energy. So ASHRAE standard 100's language um, provides a number of different pathways for source energy, for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, for, um, you know, there's even, I think, like electricity specific EUI target tables, natural gas specific EUI target tables. Um, and we we don't have a need for those tables. So most of the, the like kind of the deletions that you'll see where there's just paragraphs that are deleted out of this chapter um, just have to do with removing the sections that aren't applicable for Oregon. Um, oh, there's also tables. So ASHRAE, it's an, it's an international standard. So they not only publish um, tables and units of like, well, we're familiar with BTUs and square feet. Uh, so like KBTUs per square foot per year for our EUI, but they also publish tables in um, like in units of, uh, in SI units in joules per meter, um, which, I think if you presented joules and, and meters squared to a lot of folks, they'd um, you know wonder what you were talking about. So um, you know, just not something that's not units that are common here. So we'll we'll remove those tables as well. Um, so just kind of going down the line, um, that so that's where these these edits here just talk about like removing the um, the source energy targets. Um, Ashbury one hundred has some language around how the targets were developed. Um, we're developing our targets separately, you know, unique Oregon based targets. So that's not applicable for us either. So chapter or section 7121 has to do with source energy targets, custom source energy conversion factors, not applicable for Oregon. 7131 greenhouse gas intensity targets, again, not applicable for Oregon. Uh, chapter 7.2 is this is where it gets into um, like determining the actual target based on the um, the type of building that it is. So this one this this chapter specifies that the energy manager or the qualified person shall determine the EUI target um, for either if it's a single type activity building according to section 7.2.2 or if it's a mixed use type building according to section 7.2.3. And then there is this allowance for covered buildings that are pursuing compliance at the um, connected building level shall determine EOI targets at the connected building level. So that's where there's multiple buildings 
that um, you know might be. And then there's a definition for connected building that are um, you know maybe all on the same meter can look at that whole um, you know at the campus at the connected buildings EUI to determine the target if they're not submetered. Hey, hey, Blake, can I ask yeah. a question? I was sure. wondering when I looked at that, is, uh, and I think you might just just answer it. Connecting buildings is just a small campus. Is that and they get treated the same way? Is that fair? To it say? is. Yeah. So let's, if you want, we can look at the definition of connect of what is a connected building. So, um, you know, connected buildings are a collection of buildings with a shared energy meter on a contiguous property. And then a contiguous property is adjoining property under sole ownership. So that's where you have, like, you know, I, I, right, a, a kind of a campus of buildings that's all owned by the same building owner um, that might be on one meter where you would be able to combine those buildings as connected buildings and look at the, the total square footage and the total EUI for the purposes of compliance. Um, you know, each individual building would trigger compliance based on its square footage. So it's not the total square footage that triggers compliance of all the buildings. But if you do have one covered building that's over the 35,000 square foot threshold for eventual compliance, um, and it happens to be connected to other buildings, then instead of investing in a submeter to only be able to carve out the energy usage for that one covered building, you could also treat it as a campus. As the, as a connected building, is that is that clear? Yeah, yeah I think that makes sense. Yeah. And and so I think throughout the rules, um, they get essentially the same treatment: connected buildings and campuses. Or I think we're going to get to that, right? Right. Yeah, we'll talk. There, there, there's other maybe some campus considerations that we'll that we'll get into later too. Yeah, if we have time, this toward the end of the agenda. Yeah. Um, Blake, a question for you, whether it's a connected building with multiple use types or a multi-use building, or is there a, an adjustment, maybe we just haven't seen it yet, on uh, based on like floor area to determine what the EUR target it would be? Uh, there is, yeah, yeah, there is. So that um, that's actually coming up. That's a good segue into the next section. Um, so... The, uh, so if you have just one building, one type of building, you determine the the target just based on that, um, you know, the single, the single EUI target, um, and then there's this operating shifts normalization factor that's in there too. But um, for buildings with multiple types, um, those, um, so yeah, it's the, that's the next section, seven point two point three. Um, that essentially weights the targets based on the, the square footage percentages of each individual occupancy type. So you take the, um, the, the percentage of gross floor area for that activity multiplied by the target for that, act, that type of building and then generate that weighted average based on the square footage percentages for the overall building. Does that answer the question, Vin? I think that was Vin. Yeah, yeah, this is Vin. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that does answer it. I'm, and I'm thinking ahead, maybe we're going here too, but um, yeah. one thing that we run into where we have shared energy systems on campuses is um, often there's other building use types like residential that are included. So therefore there needs to be a residential EUI target, even though that's not a covered type because there's no way for them to, unless they submit or to separate out their Residential buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting scenario because then you'd essentially be bringing a non-covered building into coverage, right? Um, and I'm interested in feedback from the rack on if that, like, if if we have a a non-covered building type that's lumped in with one building's meter, like if if that becomes like a covered building just by default because it's all on the same meter, or if we want to direct building owners to sub-meter out so that they're only including covered building types. Like, would we ever want to force a, a tier two building or a non-covered building to become a covered building just because it doesn't have its own meter? Uh, 
Um, so maybe... I, yeah, I, hope, I don't know if that question is kind of clear, but um, you know, I, I, I think it, yeah. Quick, quick uh, comment. Maybe what's helpful is it sounded like last meeting or the meeting before you uh, you mentioned that like private sub metering would be allowed, and so. It seems to me that at that point, if you had a single meter and buildings that are not covered or otherwise the disadvantage in utilizing that single meter, probably sub metering, private sub metering would be the way to go and somewhat, you know, cost effective if it allows to exclude non covered buildings from a connected building situation. Right. Yeah, so, and that that sort of situation, I think would be, yeah, would be allowed where you've got a separate, uh, you know, invest in a, a separate, just private meter to be able to separate out right. the covered building usage from the non covered building usage. Um, yeah, I see there's a comment in the chat about allowing for sub metering or some type of calculation. For averaging out the non covered building. Um, yeah, I, um, maybe there's more more there. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm totally grasping everything that's. Um, that's there, but. Um, is that I think that's um, Michael aren't I'm, I'm happy to take a take a comment there if you want to expand upon that a little bit. Um, maybe let's see. I don't know if I can unmute. But, what's call I mean, um, um, Abby, maybe you could try to figure out if we can unmute um, Michael there um, so he can expand on his comment while we kind of move move on. Um, can I share a thought on that real quick before we move on to comment? Sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I'm thinking about like district heating systems um, that are, or campus heating systems. And uh, sub metering maybe is a, a good thing too, but there's a, an opportunity to improve that system itself at the central system by having like a whole like campus EUI. But I think almost all of those are going to be tier two buildings. I think you'll run into tier one buildings that are just on a common meter. Like uh, the city has multiple scenarios that even involve other property owners too, um, where we have one meter serving multiple buildings. And I, I think it does the, the city's in investment into energy management in that case, it's, it's just the meter, right? It's not like the systems are connected. These are like uh, scenarios where there's there are three wholly different HVAC systems. And an energy submeter, when a level of energy efficiency is investments made, is beneficial to have the submeter because then you can see the improvement of the of the energy efficiency and be able to track its progress over time to see if you're commissioning in the future, for instance. So I think it's it's really a best practice as a a building owner um, to have a submeter in those scenarios, which is I think more the more common tier one scenario that you're going to run into. Yeah, I, I agree that sub metering is is a good practice to be able to tell like that where the energy is being used and where you're making improvements. Yeah. So is it uh, like I guess in these situations, like is it is it reasonable to like in where you've got like one meter for a covered build like for multiple that serves multiple either covered buildings and uncovered buildings or multiple like covered buildings and exempt buildings like there's a note in the chat about industrial campuses where they've got you know might be one building serving an office but the other ones are serving exempt industrial use facilities um is it reasonable to require a building owner to sub meter out the the covered buildings to be able to report Yeah, I mean, I see, I, I do understand the concern about, and which is why I think what we're trying to avoid, um, you know, submetering comes with the cost for sure. Um, 
So like it's it's that balance between being able to identify the energy usage for the covered spaces um, without, I mean, because then the alternative is if you don't submeter, the alternative is that you don't know the energy usage for your covered buildings and you potentially bring a non-covered building into scope, into coverage, just because there's not a separate meter to be able to tell. So, I mean, to me, I mean, from a, it, it seems like the, the choice of a building owner would be rather than bring square footage in that wouldn't otherwise be covered would be to install a submeter. Um, in, in most cases, it seems like the, the more cost effective option. And then kind of the Vince point with the submeter, you can tell where your, where your improvements actually are. Maybe it's, um more about like what's your default and so if the submeter is the default as a best practice that also allows for the eui target to match that building rather than to be lost in you know multiple buildings um, mm -hmm. that are under different management especially um maybe it's better to just have that default be submeter and then have exceptions to the rule yeah for, because of cost issues like might come out in the savings to investment ratio or other places yeah and actually, um, so for the, um, you know, now that I think about it a little more too, so for buildings, so a submeter wouldn't necessarily be required. It would just be that that property would then be treated as a, or could be treated as a building without an energy target. So you wouldn't necessarily need a, a specific target for each of the buildings that are part of a, um, you know, part of a campus meter. It would just be that everything on the, you know, demand side of that meter just becomes a building without a target and it needs to follow the investment criteria pathway. Um, so then it becomes, I think, a, a judgment call or a you know, investment decision by the owner to either install a submeter and narrow the scope of what needs to be managed and reported um, to just the covered building or not installing a submeter and then treating the entire square footage of the campus downstream of the meter as the um, you know the investment criteria pathway to do an energy audit, um, reduce energy consumption. So Blake, can you clarify if you have you have what you're saying is you have a covered building that has a target, but because the meter addresses that building and non-covered buildings, now the entire campus or connected buildings would have would um, would have no targets. And follow the um, the alternative pathway. Yeah, I think so. So I think they'd essentially be forced into following the investment criteria pathway um, if they can't separate out the um, you know the the building use because it it wouldn't it wouldn't have a a target. They wouldn't be able to tell the performance relative to a to a target, and they would need to audit you know still just audit the covered building. And implement measures for the covered building, um, but that building essentially wouldn't have a wouldn't be able to tell its performance relative to a to a target. So, uh, just a follow up question there, just trying to understand this. So, if there is an uncovered building associated with this covered building, um, you don't submit it. So you have to do the investment criteria. Is that right? Which would be just a general energy audit, and then you'll get EEMs, and you have to Im implement those. Would you do that audit for the entire covered and uncovered section of that building, that greater building, or would you just would? Are we going to put language that limits it just to the covered building? Yeah, I think that's um, that, that's a good question, and kind of what I was I think what I was kind of getting at. I don't know that we could require audits for the uncovered parts. For the uncovered spaces, right? Because mm -hmm. they're not they're not covered. I, I don't I don't know that that we could do that. Yeah, that that kind of sounds right to me. Okay. Like, do you see hands up? It looks like uh, there are hands up. Oh, uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, Blake. It's Kara. Uh, just to make flagging the EPS rack member Clark is not actually able to unmute himself. Um, I just put it in the chat too. I'm not sure if that's something that can be fixed. 
Yeah, let's see what. Um, I don't know. Let's see where. Don't see. Yeah, Abby, I don't know if you're able to uh, to address that if you're if you're on and and hearing this. Um, I don't actually see Clark Clark's name on the. Now, I know he called me before this and said he might be kind of going in and out of service, but um, I'm looking right now. I don't even see Clark's name. On okay, anything. yeah, he was on before. Maybe he's been bumped off. I I, I saw his name before. Yeah, um, so maybe he's maybe he's off now. But if we see him come back on, um, yeah, Abby, are you are you there? Can you can yeah, you hear me I'm and here. confirm that if you see Clark come back on, if you can try to try to get him um, so he's able to speak. Yeah, that'll be great. Okay. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I see Ben's question about the cost of a privately owned submeter um, versus a utility owned submeter. I don't. I don't know if anybody else has any input there. I, I don't know that. So, um, so it kind of sounds. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just that was that a there was was that a question about the cost of submeters? Because you know we've been through this a number of times. Um, there are, um, I mean, submetering is expensive for property owners, but it seems like there are more affordable options coming on the market. Um, you know, wireless submeters. That that are a couple of like maybe like six hundred bucks versus like five thousand bucks, which is um, a huge huge improvement. Obviously, I feel like it is something that that it would be really beneficial to like put put a one or two pages together when this when the rubber hits the road on this and help property owners like find the right affordable submeters. Because mm -hmm. if you go down the 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 old school path, it just can be very expensive and. And also, if you don't have um, wireless submetering, it becomes really difficult to deal with all of those old um, electrical architecture in, in a building, you know. Right. Yeah. I'm in on that. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so it sounds like we kind of landed on the you know general direction for where you might have a, a, a campus or connected buildings, they're all in one meter. Um, you know, it's easy if they're all covered buildings, you generate your um, your EUI target based on the weighted average of square footages. Um, but if we do have situations where they're either on covered buildings or buildings without targets, and the building owner would then have a choice to either submeter it to be able to carve out just the covered buildings, um, or if they, you know, if that's a an investment that isn't desired then they could follow the investment criteria pathway, but that investment criteria pathway would remain only applicable to the covered buildings. It wouldn't extend to the non-covered buildings. So just to kind of sum up what I think I heard from the discussion there. Um, and that, uh, you know, we'll make sure that the language um, kind of includes that in there. Um, okay, so, there are some, so this is the way in 7.2.3, this is the equation that is just weighted average of developing the targets based on different building types and square footages, but there are some exceptions um, to the way that ASHRAE um, kind of addresses other situations. So um, in spaces, so exception one, in spaces where more than 75% of the gross floor area has a unique building activity um, shall be either reported as a single use building or as a multi use building um, in accordance with this with uh, either 72 or 7.3 so we're this is basically just saying that if a building type is the great majority of 75% more than 75% of one type of use then you can either treat it as that use or you can do the weighted average so if it's easier just to to treat it as the the single use that is 3 quarters or more of the of the building, then then that's a pathway, or you can break it up into the weighted average square footages. Um, and then it also, uh, you know, basically exception two says that spaces less than 10% of the gross floor area with the unique building activity 
can combine their floor area with the building within the building that is a similar building activity, um, kind of as determined by the energy um, manager or the qualified person. So again, just like for building type spaces that are you know relatively small, they can be combined. Um, and then uh, exception three spaces and buildings um, that have multiple activities that are not listed in table 7.1. So 7.1 is this list of, of all the different building activity types. Um, and again, it aligns with Energy Star Portfolio Manager building types. Um, so then I'll go on back down to the exception. So spaces and buildings with activity types not listed in 7.1 and have a total, like not so that, that would mean they don't have a target. Um, have a total non-target area that's less than 10% of the building gross floor area can be excluded from the EUI target calculations if the energy use of that space is metered separately. Um, the EUI target for the remaining part of the building shall be calculated after deducting the, enlist, um, the unlisted building area um, from the building gross floor area. So this um, kind of it's kind of similar to a situation that we were talking about before with like separate buildings, but here it's just talking about like spaces within a building. If you've got a space within a building um, that's less than 10%, that's a non-covered building. If you do happen to have a submeter on that building, you can remove the energy use and the square footage from that and treat the building as if it were just a building without that square footage and energy use and develop your own, um, you know, your own target or your, yeah, yeah, your own um, like unique target just for the, the like covered building type that's listed in table 7.1. So it just gives the ability for the owner if it's submeter to carve out that space from the building if they want. And then exception four is, so if it's like a similar type of space activity type that's not listed in the table, if it's between 10 and 50% of the gross floor area, um, then it can either comply with this exception three that we just talked about. So if the sub metering does exist, then it can um, carve it out and just like exclude it, treat the building as if it were just the smaller, the smaller part of the building. Um, or it can go the um, sections 4.2, 4.3, 4.4.1, 4 and 4.4.3. Um, and what those sections are, those are the um, energy management plan. Um, and then the, um, like for the sections that define like building performance for buildings that don't have a target. So it would essentially be treating it as a building that doesn't have a target that needs to go the investment criteria pathway. So, and this just says that, like, the, so if they do, like, subtract out the um, the energy use and the square footage, then the energy target for the remaining part of the building is calculated after deducting the um, the unlisted building type from the gross floor area. So again, just like carving out that um, that section that is submetered and removed because it's not not listed, not a covered building type. So um, any questions? Oh, it looks like Rick has a hand raised. Rick Hodges. Yeah. Um, at some point, some examples might help uh, visualize these. But if a building has mm -hmm. not qualified square feet that you're deleting or removing, that doesn't pull the building out of needing to report, does it? Like if you had a, a building right on the threshold, but 10% or 30% of their building didn't qualify as, would that make the whole building exempt or would they still be a large enough building so they'd have to qualify just with less square footage? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it's, it does. Yeah, so it's it's the latter. So if you just, um, so the buildings are still the square, the gross square, square footage of gross floor area of the buildings that trigger compliance. Um, so yeah, if you if you carve out the buildings without a target um, or the spaces without a target, it wouldn't 
necessarily change the compliance schedule for that building. Okay. And so on yeah. a, a scenario of like a predominantly condo with ground floor retail, if even if it's, if mm -hmm. you gotta go look at that, that percentages, but you could have, you know, a hundred residential units and only, you know, three commercial spaces, but those three commercial spaces would have to report, but you'd exclude all the residential. Is that right? Um, so that, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. There's so many scenarios here and I think you're right. Eventually, you know, once we kind of do get the language kind of lined out, developing some like example scenarios will be, will be key, um, to help folks understand what's required. But, um, no, I mean, I think in, in a case where you've got like primarily, a like a, a tier two residential building, I don't know that though with maybe like a little bit of commercial space, um, I, I, I don't know that we would be lumping then that commercial space in with a in with the building performance standard. Um, I don't know, but kind of yeah, it kind of interested in thoughts around that and like what a potential dividing line might be. Yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, downtown Portland core, for example, there's you know a lot of that ground level. So maybe Ben has suggestions there too, but all those individual units would probably be metered separately each mm -hmm. from an electrical perspective i guess i should say but uh and those ground floor units the, the chipotle and the starbucks or whatnot but they don't make up hardly they're one out of you know ground floor is one out of ten so you know, ten percent of mm -hmm. the first square footage but yeah curious but they could all still be on a central system in theory so yeah yeah yeah, that's a good point that I think we'll need to address. Interested if there's any thoughts on on that from the rest of the rack too. Well, it almost seems like um, that there needs to be a definition. If a building has covered and non-covered uses. What is the port the size of the non covered and the covered use to trigger the building to be covered? Right, that's essentially what we're saying. Right. Is it a square footage or percentage of the building or something? A mix, right? Is that um, I don't know. Uh, the typical, I don't know, four over one is 25% or 20% commercial or this 80% non covered or tier two buildings. Mm -hmm. Well, in Portland, uh, a good example is the Coin Tower, iconic building, and it has condominiums on top, office buildings below, <clears throat> and so we we use that as kind of a one to sort through whether or not the commercial building energy benchmarking applies to it. Um, and the other thing I'll add in is we also have exceptions for parking garages because we don't want we don't cover. Uh, parking garages unless they're enclosed and conditioned. Um, so when you combine the residential with the parking garage, then it's not a covered building because we base it on the percentage of floor area. It's 50% it, being our threshold. It's like majority of floor area, covered space, then it's covered. But in the, the state's definition, depending on how you define parking garage, because that can, you know, certainly important. And there's a lot of big parking garages that are parts of buildings. Um, that can really you know change the the way you look at it and there, there's other cases too of office buildings that have residential components to them too that are that are covered so we we probably have like out of a, a thousand covered buildings maybe um 50 that include residential spaces because they're 50 percent or more commercial by floor area mm -hmm. Okay, and just for clarification, so parking garages um, for BPS purposes don't contribute toward the square footage of a of a building's like compliance for the purpose, like square footage for the purposes of like whether or not they're covered or not. So, um, okay, so yeah, I'm, uh, you know, interested if if anyone does have any like comments in the future too about like what that kind of what Alex said, like what that threshold for like when a, a percentage of total square footage, like when a when a building becomes like a tier one building versus a 
versus the tier two for those mixed use sorts of spaces. I um, I think I think that yeah. I think the legislative language can help. Uh, it seems like it says they're talking about the gross gross floor area equal to the you know threshold, mm -hmm. which means um, I guess the way I interpret the like sort of a, if a building um, is fifty thousand square feet and thirty five thousand square feet is covered, then whenever that size triggers, then that would trigger the requirement. So we basically Seems like legislation looks at this by size of use, not size of building. So if you have a mixed use building, you would look at the covered use area and then depending on um, what size that is, it, it gets covered accordingly. Does it make sense for them how I interpret this? Um, I, I think it does. Yeah, we'd have to kind of think about that a little bit. Yeah, a little bit more, um, and I'm interested in other other folks' takes on that too, because um, I think yeah, determining like the the because then you're talking about like not just looking at the gross floor area of a building, which I think is you know somewhat an easier number to to know, and then you're talking about like actually subdividing that out into the covered building types to determine whether or not it's over that over that threshold. So you know it's then it becomes much more of an exercise on the building owner to to lay out like which parts of the buildings are covered and, and uncovered. And I think it provides, you know, some opportunities or just pathways for defining different square footages and different uses, you know, throughout a building and becomes a little bit less clear about like what, you know, what buildings are over and under the threshold, I think, from a from a compliance standpoint. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So just to clarify, then compared to what's in the code uh, that we're looking at right now, that's a little different, right? Because the the it, it for Portland is very similar. But let's see, at a hundred thousand square foot building, it's essentially a multifamily residential building. Um, it has thirty five thousand square feet of commercial on the first two floors, or even like that. It could be just a, you know a, a block. So for, it could be first floor. Then that would actually be covered, or even if it was like a 500,000 square foot multifamily residential building with 35,000 square feet on the first floor, that would now be covered. Right. Under the definition he defines, Alex, just to you know, make sure I understand like what that definition means. Yeah, and that, I think that's basically how it's in the language. So I wonder if this would be basically if a covered if a building would be covered, but uh, by building by gross building size, but the building owner interprets the building, you know, the covered usage area is smaller than the total building coverage. Then they would have to basically the I guess the burden of proof would be on them to to prove that the area that's actually covered is less than a tier two, tier one building. But I un totally understand that this is complicated and not clear and difficult to, um, mm -hmm. to follow. I think that it's, you're gonna run into a challenge with that, with uh, the data that's available to identify which buildings are covered, mm -hmm. where that, at least in Multnomah County, we use tax assessor data they had to identify a primary use type, like they'll say it's office building, but that scenario that's just described would be uh, defined as like apartment or condominium. And it would be, uh, in the data, it would appear not to be a covered use type because the primary use type is, is a tier two type of building. It's really difficult to, find identified buildings based on you know a certain portion being commercial when the primary use type is something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think with those comments, it'll be really hard to identify covered versus non-covered just from the state's perspective, because we don't necessarily have a have a great view into the just like in looking at a 
an overall like profile of the building, what's what the split is between different uses. You can't just drive by a building and identify that easily or you know identify it from a, a tax that's your list too. But um Okay, well, I, I think we've had a lot of good discussion on this. I think it's something that we probably need to think through a little bit more. Um, some of these like kind of end or edge like scenarios that might be more common actually than um, uh, you know than we might think uh, to to lay out like kind of a little bit more clearly what happens and how these like multi these mixed use buildings um, can be addressed. So I think we've I think we've defined a lot of the scenarios in here, but um, there's still some other scenarios that probably need a little bit more definition in there too. So, um, definitely welcome any additional comments that you either have, you know, today or, um, or later on after, after the meeting, happy to, happy to take those too. Um, and I didn't note it before, but, um, I, I put a link to a comment portal, um, up at, in the, uh, header of the draft language. So there's a link there and I can send it out to the rack after this meeting too. Um, if you do have any comments, then um, feel free to use that portal to, to submit those. So, okay. Um, so kind of moving, moving down the draft language, um, there is a provision in 90.1 that allows for these partially vacant buildings if the total floor area of non-heated, non-cooled, and non-illuminated vacant part of a building is less than 30% of the gross floor area, then it shall be excluded from the gross floor area, and the EUI target shall be determined based on the remainder of the building as described in section 7.2.3. So what this would essentially allow for is you can, um, or that you, if you've got non-heated, non-cooled, non-illuminated parts of a building, that's essentially not using any energy, then you have to subtract out that gross floor area from your EUI calculation. Um, so the, the non-heated, non-cooled, non-illuminated um, language, to me at least looks a little bit vague. Um, you know, I don't know exactly what non-heated, non-cooled, and non-illuminated means. If that's like all the, all the time, 100% of the time, like is it non-heated for climate, um, like, the occupancy, or is it just not heated for freeze protection sort of a thing? Um, and if we need, is this criteria sufficient? Um, is there anything else that's needed to, to clarify this? Um, you know, essentially in this situation, it would be reducing a building's square footage. So if you reduce a building's square footage, the denominator of that, um, the EUI calculation, it causes the EUI to go up. Um, so. So you're kind of uh, just determining the the EUI and the EUI target based on like only the occupied part of the building. So um, I don't know if there's any additional language or criteria that's that's needed there. Um, interested if there's any feedback from the rack on that one. Um, you know, otherwise that the language is not, um, oh, just for kind of a reference too. So that's not, not changed from ASHRAE 100 and that language is also in Washington state too. So, um, and then there's also the clarification that it might not, you know, um, you know, by subtracting out that floor area, it doesn't affect the building's compliance schedule. So you know, you're still tied to the same, um, total building square footage for purposes of the compliance schedule. Yeah, I don't uh, know that I really hear any uh, comments there, but if you do have any comments, feel free to on that one, feel free to submit them. I have a quick one. Uh, oh, yeah. I think one one thing that's, I guess, interesting, and, and I have to admit it's not, I'm not super firm in the world, but vacant versus unoccupied. But my understanding is, let's say we have, if there is unoccupied office space, for example, how it might be common right now, it's still, and I think that's what you're alluding to, conditioned at least to a certain degree, right? It's mm -hmm. you know, just for to protect uh, the asset. So it might not be to um, common room temperatures, but you know, frost protection or something else. So, so I'm curious what spaces this would be 
that they're non-heated, non-cooled, and non-illuminated, so then there's no light, no heating, no cooling. I don't know what spaces that would be, um, because if they're, I they're kind of struggle with, with that too. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, or, or or what the intent is here is the intent that there's like for a given period, um, uh, you know, like thirty percent or more are. Um, have been unoccupied because, you know, for like, for example, right now, there's no demand for certain spaces. And then in the, in the following period, that might be rented out again or leased out and then they've covered again that area. And like you were saying, the advantage for the building owner would be the larger area, obviously, because mm -hmm. that, that would be advantageous to the URI. So then, uh, would basically be someone else be having to identify on, you know, like unoccupied areas so they can, they should be excluded to get a more, more accurate UI for the occupied areas. So it'll be a little difficult who, who has to prove what, whether uh, an area is occupied or not, and has to be excluded or not. Right. Yeah, and I think um, you know, kind of going back to the the point about these, like I I I kind of I do struggle to think about like a situation where a to, like a a lot of the building is non heated, non cooled, and non illuminated. So maybe this is kind of a non issue um, where it's just not going to come up very often, um, mm -hmm. or you've just got a space that's entirely just like no no energy going to it. Um, so yeah, maybe this won't really even be much of an issue. So. Because to me, when you say non-heated, non-cooled, like that means nothing, right? That means like no, no freeze protection, no, like you know, emergency lighting. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know a situation really where a building owner would be, would, you know, just turn off all the energy to a space um, to protect the asset, you know, like you said. So maybe this won't really even be much of, much of a, like it won't really have much effect. Yeah, I'll just reiterate that um, there's a lot of non-occupied space in downtown Portland, for example, and I don't know any building owners that are treating that space in a non-heated, non-cooled, and non-illuminated way. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thanks. So, I given that, I don't know that we really need to change much um, here. I I don't know this where this section will would ever apply, but you know, if if for some reason it did, um, then that square footage would need to be removed. So we, we do have run into Portland where uh, folks have basement spaces and they always ask like, do you need to include that? And we use the word conditioned. So uh -huh. meaning heating, heated and or cooled. Um, and then there are times where there are whole floors where uh, they just, because of the age of the building, they are no longer occupying it. And so they, they don't heat and condition it because of that, but they'll still have some light. And same thing in the basement, there'll still be lights down there. So mm -hmm. I think the non-illuminated would get really confusing. So I just recommended in the chat to, you might want to consider unconditioned, heated or cooled. And then then you don't get any of those basement spaces because that question will come up repeatedly because there'll be, there's a lot of partially conditioned spaces in basements or these kind of weird scenarios where um, it's not really occupiable anymore. Like, like we'll have whole floors that aren't occupied and and they'll be like, we don't want to fix it. So uh, we're not conditioning it. And we're like, yeah, just take it out. You're not doing anything with it. But there will be lights. They just won't use them typically unless they have to go in there. Or there might be storage. Okay. Unconditioned storage spaces that don't, don't seem like that they should be part of the UI calculation. Yeah, thanks. To bring up my somehow I lost my chat. Okay. Um, all right. I guess moving. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for those comments and the discussion there. Uh, moving down the draft language. Just kind of keeping an eye on the time too to keep keep moving forward. Um, 
so uh, we've removed the language in 7.3, which has to do with determining the greenhouse gas target. And and then if you notice, like there's a bunch of pages, if you've scrolled through here, with, there's a bunch of pages with tables um, of targets that have been removed. So some are the, the site EUI targets that have been removed because we'll have our own. Um, and then others are the source EUI targets and different units um, of targets, uh, like in um, you know, megajoules per meter squared. So we've, we've removed all of those as well. So I'll just scroll quickly through all these tables that have been removed. If you do have any questions on any of them, feel free to feel free to ask. But um, you know, removed all the source energy targets. There's even targets for um, the greenhouse gas intensity targets for each building type, each climate zone, um, and then it even gets into I think electricity based. Where am I? There we go. Um, electricity site energy use targets for just like individual fuels. Um, so we've we've removed those as well. Um, as soon as my word catches up here, I'll keep scrolling. Might need just to go that way. There we go. Um, and then that, that pretty much covers all of because uh, uh, those tables kind of brought us to the end of uh, seven six, And then there's a final section about GHG targets for partially vacant buildings, and we removed that section too. So, so that brings us to chapter eight, the energy audit requirements. Um, so the energy audit shall be performed by a qualified energy auditor. Um, and if you go back to, that's a defined term, and if we you know, go, go back to the definition, Right now, the um, in order to be a qualified energy auditor, you would need either to be a licensed engineer or architect, or to have a uh, one of two certifications, either the ASHRAE Building Energy Assessment Professional Certification or the um, AEE Certified Energy Auditor Certification. Um, so one of those, one of those criteria would need to be met in order to be able to perform a an audit for BPS purposes. Um, so, and you know, when audits are required, the energy auditor um, needs to to do an audit and then submit the forms. Um, and we've got this in a manner as specified by the authority having jurisdiction. So, what exactly submitting that audit um, looks like um, is kind of to be determined. Um, and the forms, uh, you know, I don't think we envision like getting an individual like audit report from every like a PDF sent into us. Um, but we, you know, I, we know that there's tools out there like the um, audit template, USDOE's audit template that we're looking at that do interface with some of the other softwares that are out there for BPS program compliance. So that's something that we're looking at. But, um, you know, that manner of act, the actual like process of submitting that audit, um, you know, won't be determined. Um, that, that'll be part of our program implementation. Um, so, you know, how we submit that would be would come later. Um, so then, you know, again, we've kind of kept a lot of the language for, you know, energy audit with the carbonization assessments. Um, so energy audit with the carbonization assessment kind of determines the achievable levels of greenhouse gas emissions reductions in a building through efficiency, electrification, fugitive greenhouse gas emissions reduction, and on-site renewable energy. Um, there's this sentence in here that I, you know, kind of went back and forth about whether or not to keep. Because um, it talks about beyond identification of EMs as in a typical energy audit, the decarbonization assessment considers ERMs, including electrification measures, um, even partial electrification solutions, fugitive ERMs, and further renewable energy measures. Um, you know, whether or not that's needed. Um, curious if there's any any feedback there too, um, or any input. Um, you know, particularly around because. You know, it, it talks about this electrification measures where electrification isn't necessarily a, um, you know, our, our BPS is based on site EUI um, and not fuel type. So. I was going to pipe in and just say that we had mm -hmm. mentioned a couple of times about um, demand response or resiliency, grid flexibility. Mm -hmm. There's some aspects there that getting rid of the ERMs, I feel, 
maybe precludes that from being in an audit. And so that could be one area where we bring that back in. Oh. Um, so I see. Yeah. Okay, so maybe just like listing demand response, grid um, grid interaction in that and maybe in this first sentence, like in the list of uh, of things that are that are included, like that that could be included within an audit. You know, don't right, not necessarily, but just to provide a little bit of guidance. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so then, you know, moving further down in the sections, there's not, we're not a whole lot of, uh, you know, ad amendments or edits made to the audit sections other than the time that ERM was uh, mentioned, just removing that, uh, that reference or that requirement. Um, but I did want, because I did want to kind of spend a little bit of time to hopefully get some feedback on the levels of audits that are required as part of the part of the program. So um, for folks that are familiar, ASHRAE has a, um, Another standard, standard 211, that defines levels of energy audits. So there's a level one audit, which is you know less intensive, level two, and then level three, which is the most most intensive um, in terms of the work and uh, analysis that goes into it. And in standard 100, it references that audit shall be a level two audit. Um, so you know generally the difference between a level one and a level two audit. A level one is more of a walkthrough audit where you take like a high level look at what are some of the energy savings measures that are typical for that sort of a building, um, maybe rank them as in terms of like high, medium, low investment, high, medium, low payback, um, and with some rough ballpark estimates on the cost and the savings, but um, you know, wouldn't really be considered an investment grade audit where a building owner might be able to like take it and really determine what the payback is what the life cycle cost assessments are based on a level one audit. Um, you know, it's more of a walkthrough. Um, you know, you might look at whole building historical energy use, but not a lot of like um, data gathering or like, uh, like any sort of like end use specific measurements or end use um, analysis or determ determinations that are made as part of that audit um, for level ones. But level two kind of brings it up a step where you're maybe doing more like measurement um, data logging on site to determine trends, looking at actual, getting quotes on actual costs and um, determining within a higher degree of confidence what the savings and what the costs are. So um, these do require, uh, the, the standard ASHRAE 100 requires these level two audits to be determined, so, or to be, uh, to be performed. That takes a little bit, you know, adds a little bit more of, a, you know, a level of robust Yes, to the to the audit requirements. So maybe I'll pause there to see if there's any any comments um, on the appropriateness of that of that level remaining. Um, there are some, let's see. Oh, now I'm actually seeing the chats again. So it's back. Um, oh, so they're just going back through some of the questions. Will a person with a CEM qualify as an auditor? Um, no, it would only be the CEA, uh, the Certified Energy Auditor. It's a different certification from um, AEE. So not not just the CEM, but a CEA would, would have that. Um, the Are you defining level one and level two audits? This big just through reference. So there is a reference to um, standard 211, and they would be defined through that reference. Um, and then will uh, will level one audits need to be reported? So any and there will be a yes all audits that are performed for um, BPS compliance would will need to be reported, um, whether or not it's a level one or a level two audit. However we however we land. With that language, it would need to be need to be reported. So, uh, what's the projector ratio of audits versus auditors? Yeah, so um, this is a separate issue, but I'll I'll address it kind of kind of quickly too. 
Um, we do see the need for more auditors in Oregon, you know, particularly if there's thousands of buildings um, that are coming in for uh, you know compliance and they'll need to be audited if they're not meeting an energy target um, or if they're going through the investment criteria pathway. Um, so we are attempting to, there's some federal funds that are available to help incentivize and get more um, qualified energy auditors in the workplace. Um, and just, you know, nothing's, nothing's guaranteed yet, obviously, with the whole federal application process, but we are attempting to get some additional funding to help support more folks becoming qualified energy auditors in Oregon. So, you know, we know there's a, there's a good pool out there that do a lot of work for our utility programs and for our agency, like we have a schools program with qualified energy auditors, but um, we want to make sure that there's potentially more. In there too, so so I do see. So Washington expanded the auditor qualifications to include the CEM. Um, so that was I, I looked at the Washington regs, and I, as of what I saw, it only included the CEA, and not the CEM. But that's something I can go back and and double check. Um, we did our best to to match Washington's there, and from what I saw, Washington's only included the CEA. So. But I'll, I'll double check that too. So, Blake, my my hands up. Yeah. Is it okay to just interrupt you? Oh yeah, sorry, I'm I'm only viewing. That's okay. One. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, Kara here from GEI. Um, wondered, and maybe this is something you're planning to do since you just mentioned Washington. But I uh, wondered if if Washington's yet in a place where they can give some recommendations about uh, level one versus level two. Um, yeah, it might it might be that. You know, we start with level one and, and then maybe move into level two if a building appears to need it. I'm just on talking fly here, but yeah, I'm just thinking about trying to make this process as easy as possible. Yeah, thanks. Good, good comment. That's something we can look at. Okay. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, kind of continuing to move down through the language to get through um, some of this. So uh, there is this exception for, you know, you don't need to do an audit if you've had an audit recently covered or recently done for your building. Um, the standard 100 includes this three-year window. Um, is this is this an appropriate window? Washington's window is, is a five-year window. Um, so we do, we want to expand it a little bit to include you know, five years, I'm um, you know, inclined to, to say that it's probably okay, just because there's other, there's these other criteria in there too, that, you know, provided that the scope of the audit is still, you know, applicable, there haven't been changes to the systems. Um, so it seems to me like a five-year window is, is, is allowable as well. Um, so just wanted to kind of bring that to see if there was any, any general objections to expanding that window. Not hearing any, and maybe kind of to to Kara's point too about kind of making it maybe Ill, as easy as possible. If somebody's had an audit done, they don't necessarily need to go do another one. They can just use the, the results of a previous one. Yeah, I, I like that thinking, but but I will also note that there's a lot of support in the chat for level two, and and I don't have any particular okay. um, preference one way or the other. Just just curious what Washington's experience has been. Thanks. Yeah. Hey Blake, can you hear me? This click. I can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, even though they're, if we go to three years or five years, will they still have to report annually? Their energy use. Um, they would still. I mean, we so they would still need to probably report annual usage, but the compliance period is only every five years. So we I don't think we expect getting like an, an audit every year. Right, you I, know, get, the, I get that. But to me, it seems that if the ODO is still getting annual usage data, you'd be able to at least identify people who had done an audit, but then are starting to uh, veer off course, let me say. Yeah, yeah, um, right. And then you'd be able to potentially do some preemptive outreach for them it says, I know it's not five years, but you guys are veered off, you're veered off course. Yeah, so. 
Yeah, I think that's a that's a good. So comment. I think potentially being explicit about it, uh, the maybe it's five years between audits, but annual reporting is still required. Period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good good comment. Okay, so I guess moving down um, the the language. So uh, this. So the first part just kind of talked about like uh, energy audits with um, decarbonization decarbonization assessment requirements for buildings without performance targets, um, and then eight point three point one is for buildings with performance targets. Um, so most of the changes to this section too, again just or to remove the references to ERMs and greenhouse gas emissions reductions, um, just to remove that from the language there. And then it um, talks about, so like where you've got a, a target and you're trying to determine whether or not the audit helps you get down to meet your target, um, you just calculate your the adjusted EUI, which is like the situation where if you do the measures in the audit, what is it, what will get, what will get you? How much will it reduce your EUI? So, that's just the calculation of um, looking at your historical energy usage, subtracting out the potential energy that you could save, um, then dividing um, that by your gross square footage to come up with what your adjusted EUI would be after you do the after you do the audits. And it lays out this process, or after you do the measures, rather, and it lays out the process about um, if the EEMs identified in the audit. Um, have not been implemented, then if implemented or would result in the building meeting its EUI target, measures shall be implemented for the building and the project shall follow the procedures in section nine. Um, so, you know, just to clarify too, that even though it says these measures shall be implemented by the building, the project shall follow the procedures in section nine. Section nine talks about implementation and that's where the investment criteria pathway comes in. So in case there's any like concern that this language is saying, like you got to do all the measures that come up in an audit. There's still the criteria in section nine that reference the investment criteria pathway as as allowable. So, um, you a building owner would not be required to do every single measure in an audit if it doesn't align with the cost effectiveness pathway of the investment criteria. Um, but then it does say that. You know, if the identified EEMs do not result in adjusted EOI less than the EOI target, a new audit needs to be done um, to like identify measures that get down to the get down to the target. Um, and then eight point four is the energy energy audit with decarbonization assessment. Just some. General language, and this is where the reference back to ASHRAE not or uh, two eleven comes in, um, where it just references. So, what does the level one audit mean? What does level two audit mean? And it references back to the other standard ASHRAE two eleven that defines what those levels of audits are. So that rounds out chapter eight. Um, kind of getting into chapter nine now, the implementation and verification requirements. Um, let's see, I'll take a minute here to see if there's any, I don't see, I'm not seeing any hands raised right now. So, um, chapter nine gets into, so like, okay, now you, you've done an audit you've done your like management plan, um, impl implementing it and verifying it. So, you know, buildings that have performance targets shall comply with the requirements of 9.1.1 that don't buildings that don't have targets. You can apply with 9.1.1.2. Um, it's got this. We've just removed the uh, threshold for 5,000 square foot buildings because we don't have any covered buildings that are that small. So then just replace that with all covered buildings. Shall implement an energy and emissions management plan. Um, and section five just references back to the sections we've already covered. Um, and then so 9.1.1.1, buildings with performance targets. Um, the EEMs identified from the audit with the decarbonization assessment shall be implemented in order to meet the building's energy use intensity target. Um, develop a written plan for maintaining the building's EUI at or below the target. Implementation of the EEMs 
in the plan for maintaining building operations below the target shall not result in an increase in the building's EUI. Um, so this section tells the building owner that they you know need to do and they need to implement the measures in the audit, but there's these exceptions. So, and this is what provides the pathway for the investment criteria. Exception one, our buildings may also demonstrate compliance, may demonstrate compliance by implementing all of the EMs that achieve the investment criteria in Appendix YY. Um, and I've just, that YYY is a placeholder um, right now. So as we kind of get into actually figuring out how all this is ordered. So I just put that as a placeholder, but. Um, and then I'll just uh, real quick section. And so right after this, we'll uh, kind of get into the investment criteria. We don't have much more in chapter nine, but um, so we'll just kind of pause on what that investment criteria means for now. Um, but then there's also exceptions in the um, in in this section about if a building has like district heating, or if you're complying at the campus level or connected building level that you could also perform measures or implement measures at the you know, at the district heating level or district cooling level or at the campus level um, that are identified in the audit, providing that they save energy at the you know at the building too. So there's just some of those uh, exceptions, and these um, exceptions are uh, basically similar copied over from Washington to address campus scenarios too. Um, and then the pathways for buildings without performance targets. So a building with a performance target can comply by just meeting the, uh, you know, meeting the EUI. A building without a performance target needs to qualify through the investment criteria. So by doing an audit and doing all the measures that are identified as cost effective in the audit. Um, and there are a number of exceptions in ASHRAE 100 that will um, kind of qualify when a particular measure or optimized bundle of measures needs to be installed um, for buildings without performance targets. But um, instead of treating these as exceptions just within the body of this chapter nine, we just reference over to the investment criteria appendix for, um, for those requirements. So they're not, instead of including them just as exceptions in the chapter, just point to the investment criteria appendix um, for those, like for those specifications. Um, same thing around like this language around optimized bundle of EEMs and ERMs, because all that, that optimized bundle language is all in the um, investment criteria appendix. Um, see, and then there's not too many other changes throughout the rest of the language other than um, just removing the references to ERMs and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I think with that, if, unless there's any questions on chapter nine, I think we can probably move on to the investment criteria at this point. So I'll take a minute and just open that up. Um, let's see. Maybe I'll just kind of provide a quick overview of this chapter, um, and then hopefully we can kind of get into some discussion around this. Um, so uh, this language was copied over from um, the Washington program to kind of provide a starting point for us here. Um, so demonstrating compliance with the investment criteria. So building seeking compliance with um, you know that exception that we just looked at to 9.1.1 or 9.1.2 for either cover buildings with targets or cover buildings without targets um, shall demonstrate compliance with the financial investment criteria um, documented using a level two energy audit by performing a life cycle cost analysis. And in, you know, in general, the, the life cycle cost analysis needs to include all the measures that are in the audit that have a simple payback you know, less than the expected useful life. So what this investment criteria pathway requires is creating an optimized bundle of energy efficiency measures that 
continues to add in measures until you get to a point where the savings to investment ratio is less than one. So, you know, you can, you do say you do an audit, you have a suite of measures. Um, if some of them have a payback that's longer than their expected useful life, those can be excluded. But for all the measures that individually have a payback within their useful life, they need to be grouped together into an optimized bundle until like you, you you know, continue to add measures to the group, to the optimized bundle until that savings to investment ratio as a whole, as a bundle is less than one. And then that optimized bundle is what's required to be implemented. So you could feasibly have like measures in there that are super payback measures that, you know, pay back very quickly um, combined with other measures that maybe don't pay back quickly. You could have some measures that um, have a savings investment ratio that far exceeds one combined with measures individually that have a savings investment ratio of less than one. As long as that optimized bundle is greater than one, then that's what's required to be implemented. So um, just to kind of provide that, that general overview. And then it references, references the level two audit. And then it also references the um, NIST Handbook 135 methodology for how do you calculate life cycle cost analysis. And for some of the variables that go into the life cycle cost analysis, those are um, specified to be, that would be something that um, we as an agency would, would fix or would, would set on a periodic basis. Um, and those are variables like the discount rates to be used, the inflation rates, fuel escalation rates, um, and then um, kind of the, uh, or really those are the criteria, those are the ones that we would set periodically. Um, so I think with that, after hopefully providing that overview, happy to answer any questions on it or kind of listen to some comments with, with that. Um, let me see if I can go back to my participant list. I thought I saw maybe a hand raised there, but um, not seeing it now. Like that, was, uh, yeah, that was that was me. Uh, um, yeah. I guess can you tell me a little about the procedure? Like, are people people are going to do the audits with their consultants, and then they're going to submit right. the audits to Odo for review? Is that right? I'm just trying to understand. How, oh, will Odo actually be right. in the room as owners are making decisions okay. about which EEMs to take? Um, we is right. Yeah. So we, we would not be in, in the room with the owners deciding that that's a, that, that would be something that is up to the owner to contract with their qualified auditor, um, to, to perform the audit, to determine, you know, the savings and the costs and determine which measures and which optimized bundle, um, at some level, we will ask for the, like the audit, um, results to doc, to just have that documentation, um, whether that's through something like the audit template that USDOE has developed where you, it's like a standardized way to document the, um, the information that's typically gathered in an energy audit or through some other way, um, because, you know, doing an audit's part of the compliance with the, some of the pathways and the building performance standards. So, you know, we might ask for proof of that audit um, through documentation as part of a program, but we, we won't be involved with the audit itself. Um, or working with the billing owner to determine which measures they do to meet PPS compliance. Okay, thanks. And while I have you talking about the life cycle cost uh, cost um, analysis, mm -hmm. uh, is this the place to talk about social cost of carbon as a way to um, demonstrate viability or not of a given investment? Or is um, I, um, yeah, I think I think this would be so the. Um, Appendix X, it, it talks about what sorts of costs are to be, are expected to be included um, and what kind of savings, you know, so it talks about like the, the cost, estimate the total expected cost of implementation, um, including the following factors as applicable. Um, and then it talks about costs and savings of the recommended EMs, estimate the initial cost and recurring costs energy cost savings, non-energy cost savings of each measure, um, 
And then those are what get implemented and incorporated into this life cycle cost analysis. So, um, and it you know, talks about some of the other pieces that are in there too, but. Um, so, you know, the, the standard 100 and, and Washington's program, um, including this investment criteria, don't really consider the social cost of carbon, at least in this appendix. It's not, it's not listed explicitly. And, and has Odo content? I guess I'm just trying to understand where you're at on it, because what's interesting about the social cost of carbon is it's going to, on one hand, impose a cost to society uh, as measured by the social cost of carbon, which would be effectively a negative on the ledger. But if someone's willing to go above and beyond in their work and reduce their uh, carbon you know, emissions, then they should get a positive result on the ledger. And I'm trying to understand how Odo might do that either now or can we at least put something in the rule now that says this should be evaluated and contemplated over time and, and you know included when the time is right. I'm trying to make sure we don't permanently exclude it at the very least. Well, I think yeah. I agree. I think it could be included now because it's a savings, right? So as part of the energy savings, it's also, it's another, it goes on the saving side of things. So if a measure, uh, you know, investment ratio is below one, including social cost of carbon might bring it above one again. And so implementable, right? I think it's a savings Great. on top yeah. of the energy savings. Yeah, I just, we're going to have to make sure that the accounting looks it's it's going to require fairly careful accounting to make sure everyone the reviewing that audit agrees with that net. So that I just I want to kind of imagine how we might do that. You have more thoughts on that, Alex? Your little your little um, uh, what's difficult to understand? Can you repeat your question? Can you expand a little bit more about how that accounting might be done? And, it, and I'm imagining again, it could get more refined over time, but how might we start doing it and how we, might we improve it over time? Yeah, I think the formula, it's, it's, it's in the, uh, New York did something like that. I think there's a formula out there um, that, uh, so if you had like similar to the energy savings over the life of a measure, you have the, uh, avoided carbon that then as a cost associated for the life of the measure that then would inc include would be included in the savings calculation. So that's on your on your saving sides. If you then compare that to the investment side, um, you get the you get a different ratio, right? A different uh, ratio more likely to be above one if you factor in the avoided carbon emissions through the social cost of carbon. I think that could be I think um, uh, that could be included Immediately, we just have to agree on that, you know, the formula, just like some of the life cycle cost analysis, we would include the social cost of carbon there. And, and, um, and I think the tool that, um, we, you know, that Washington is using has the provision even to include, uh, include social cost of carbon. So I think things would be fairly easy to implement right away. So, and like, I would just, um, and I'll be done, but. I, my sense is, is this is in keeping with the part of the statute that says we want to continue to reduce emissions through this work, even though we're not doing carbon emissions accounting as part of this BPS. It seems that because the statute specifically talks about still wanting to reduce Oregon's carbon emissions, this is one way for us to do that. And I'm curious about your thought, Odo's thought, and any other of the REC members' thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to hear if there's any other REC member comments. Um, you know, maybe while, while folks are, are thinking about it a little bit too, I will maybe just for reference, pull up what the statutory definition from 3409 or savings to investment ratio um, looks like so when you're calculating the savings investment ratio, um, it it references the ratio of the total present value of savings 
the total present value of costs to implement an energy conservation measure or water conservation measure in which the numerator is the ratio of the present value of net savings in energy or water or maintenance costs um, not related to fuel use or water use that are attributable to the energy conservation measure or water conservation measure. Um, so one, you know, one, I, I think potential challenge to like requiring inclusion of the social cost of carbon, because really what, what that does to the life cycle analysis is it adds a future value stream, right? Um, a future savings, like a, a monetized value of the carbon savings for each future year. And then the net present value of that, that future value stream is then incorporated into the, like the savings number. Um, so the, you know, the, the definition in House Bill 3409, at least as far as I can see, doesn't include um, related carbon, cost of carbon savings. You know, it's got savings in energy and water or maintenance costs in there too. So, you know, I wonder if, um, you know, I, I heard your comment before Clark about like including it maybe like in there as something that we look at or maybe as an option. Um, so I'm kind of curious to rack members thoughts on that on that approach, um, you know, requiring it versus versus an optional look, because I think you're right. You know, it might be useful for some building owners who want to include it within their life cycle analysis and within their value stream to, to document that and show the, you know, for their internal organizational purposes and maybe other purposes, but um, one thing I wonder about is the ability to include it, just given the definition and statute without the clear direction to include it. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Because yeah. it was my yeah. understanding, and you'll have to pull the, I don't have the language in front of me, but it's my understanding yeah. that there is a specific mention of a desire for this law to help Oregon continue to reduce its carbon emissions. And whatever that language is, mm -hmm. that seems to be the hook that would allow this provision to be included. And I, I think it's a good thing for the RAC, we should test that idea, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there there is that kind of overarching kind of guiding principle. Um, and, and this is frankly, it's a way to do it that is being you know is already tested in multiple other jurisdictions, and it's including. Uh, it seems like it's in the spirit of the law, mm -hmm. and I wanted to check that. Yeah, I see a couple comments coming in in chat. Um, about you know, maybe preference for making it optional, but also a comment about agreeing with including it. Um, so you know that you know with, with with including it, that would you know require for every audit that's done. i was just trying to make sure I'm kind of understanding through the like some of the practical implications of it. You know, every audit that's done. Um, would you know need to so it calculates the associated greenhouse gas emissions reductions that are associated with every energy efficiency measure, um, and then it would apply a dollar like in in tons or in pounds of CO two equivalents, and then apply some dollar value to those ton reductions, and then includes that as an annual like value stream in the cost effectiveness. So it what it what it could potentially do is maybe push a a measure that isn't that's borderline cost effective or you know slightly not cost effective with the savings investment ratio and might push it into becoming cost effective. Exactly. And I guess my my thinking is is I'm not imagining requiring it. I'm imagining it being one of the options for an owner and their consultant to work with their I mean their uh, audit person to, to work to work with to make sure that if they wanted to do this, they could, but if they wanted to take other EEMs that don't change their emissions profile, they wouldn't have to take it. But it becomes a tool in the tool belt of people working. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, let's see, Nels, you've got um, some comments in the in the chat. Anything else you wanted to add? Yeah. No. So, thank you. Um, I, I I think it's an interesting idea, but it just feels like. Um, it would be prudent to tread carefully and make sure that we're doing anything, everything and uh, making sure that we comport with the bill itself and don't stray outside of the bill. So any advice we can get from the Department of Justice, I think would be really helpful in making sure that we stay in color within those lines and don't go outside of them. Yeah, thanks. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, so kind of with that, um, that kind of provides the overall framework for the investment criteria um, and this the concept of like an optimized energy efficiency bundle that includes all the measures up until the point of, you know, not cost effectiveness. Um, and I kind of highlighted some of the areas that I was, uh, you know, kind of thinking might be of particular interest to the RAC. Um, so, you know, we've got this requirement for the level two audit that we talked a little bit about before, um, using the simple payback as a screening criteria. So if that simple payback is greater than useful life, they can, any measures can be excluded from consideration. Um, identifying an, this optimized bundle to provide maximum energy savings without resulting in the savings to investment ratio of less than one. Um, Implement that optimized bundle based on the schedule established in the energy management plan. Um, let's see. Oh, so then there's also this this concept of the that the life cycle cost assessment and the management plan may include phased implementation, such that the building owner isn't required to replace the system or equipment before the end of its useful life. So if a building owner does an audit, identifies some measures that, that can be done, but some of the measures apply to equipment that still is within its useful life, there's not the requirement to immediately do that audit today. The, the building owner can um, delay that until it reaches the end of its useful life. And the thought there is that it makes the measure more cost effective by waiting until the end of the useful life because there's it then gets compared to like equipment replacement at the time. And then it's really just the incremental cost for the energy efficiency portion of the measure and not necessarily the cost of replacing the entire unit um, itself before it's needed. So there's that there's that pathway still for um, allowing deferral of the measures until um, it's the right time as long as it's like part of the part of the um, implementation plan. Um, so, you know, one, you know, one just uh, to be, uh, I, I guess kind of be uh, be transparent about one of the concerns I think that we've heard from from um, folks in the industry and from Washington is that the investment criteria could be a potential loophole um, or, you know, a potential pathway for a building owner to document um, that they've done an audit and there aren't any cost effective measures. And even if their EOI isn't meeting the target, that it's a way to still comply with the program by showing that there aren't any cost effective measures. Um, and, you know, I think there, you know, frankly, could be a, a challenge with, um, with identifying, you know, whether or not an audit is, you know, ac accurately reflecting the investment opportunities, energy efficiency investment opportunities at a, at a building. You know, there's always the potential for inflating cost and deflating savings if there's um, you know not a desire to implement any projects but that doesn't really do the building owner a service um, because they're missing they potentially miss out on an opportunity for you know investment for cost effective investment um, and then it also doesn't really help us get to our EUI target goals either um, and overall building energy and greenhouse gas reduction goals so um, you know, we, we've heard this is the concern in, in Washington and some of the other states. I think they're still kind of getting a feel for um, how much of a concern it, it would be. Um, but, you know, definitely interested in if there's any thoughts or ideas, concepts from the rack on how something like that, how can we include some sort of protective guide rows um, to, you know, get and, you know, encourage as much cost-effective investment and not require a building owner to do a bunch of measures that truly aren't cost-effective 
but to still um, you know get as much out of the buildings as we can. Uh, Clark. Yeah, so this is actually my earlier question about procedure and whether Odo would be in the room was mm -hmm. an awkward way of trying to get to this question. <laughs> okay. Because yeah. it seems like there are ways for owners to gain this, owners and or auditors. And I can imagine, uh, you know, in a cynical world, an auditor could simply be told, find a way to make this too expensive. Um, that's a worst case scenario on one end of a spectrum. But if that's a possibility, don't we want to come up with a way where understanding that Odo won't be in the room, couldn't you uh, have a policy of random audits of the work, of a certain percentage of the work so that 3% or 4% of all of the audits submitted are gonna get a rigorous um, audit themselves. And mm -hmm. if it's not deemed right, there's actually a penalty for having submitted, you know, overinflated pricing or something that's not relevant, uh, you know, matching market. Is there some way to create a uh, checks and balances system? Um, yeah, we've we, we've talked internally about the potential for like auditing the audits um, too, you know, like and what that process might look like. You know, I think ideally we we love to have the resources to be able to um, you know do more review on on all aspects of the of the program. You know, just one concern that we have is that. Um, you know, it, it could be fairly resource intensive to, you know, to track down to review somebody else's energy model, um, to, you know, to track down what we think are accurate cost for, you know, complex measures. Um, you know, I think ideally we, we do plan to have some level of um, periodic oversight. Um, you know, a lot of this, I think, goes back to, you know, what it means to be a, a qualified auditor in some cases, you know, by at least requiring some level of certification, particularly if it's an engineering license or an architectural license where, you know, there's some professional liability um, potentially on the line with performing the audits. You know, we we hope that that would be enough to to protect against. I think the situations like you're like you just described, kind of on the worst end of the of this of the spectrum. But um, you know, I think I, ideally we we would like to. Be able to do some sort of an audit on the audits periodically, some percentage. I don't know what the what the right number is, um, and we would plan to. But some of that would be dependent and contingent upon available resources. Right, but I think one way you could do it actually could you could mimic what um, the USGBC does with LEED, which mm -hmm. is they have the same people who are certified to make a LEED submission or also can be certified to review a LEED submission. And it actually become and it could be a contracted business, so that the budget wouldn't necessarily require additional headcount within Odo, which I realize may or may not fit within the legislation. But there may you may be able to get budget dollars to hire a certain number of auditors to effectively audit a certain number of audits each year, mm -hmm. and that could just get built into the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I I like the idea um, a lot. I, I'm I'm yeah, I'm kind of wondering about how to build that into the rules, or if that's just something that gets built into to program implementation, um, or just some maybe some line like on the qualified auditor definition that, um, or maybe in the auditing chapter that like Odo may audit, or like audit the audits periodically um, to determine to help determine accuracy. Um, Right, I'm just trying to find alternate ways for you yeah. to fund that effort if you have to build it into implementation. Sure. As yeah. opposed to not turning into a new headcount. Right. Yeah. I don't know that I would want to because we don't know what our what our future budgets could potentially look like. I don't want to you know, give ourselves the requirement to do something without knowing that if we can get the money to do it. Um, you know, but I but I like the idea of building like the the May parts into it. Um, and I think that would help maybe, maybe it would kind of help the industry to, uh, to almost kind of enforce itself in, in a lot of ways, you know, like if, um, you know, if, if there happens to be a, you know, a, a certain organizations that aren't, or, you know, individuals that aren't performing, um, high quality audits, then, you know, maybe the rest of the industry can help identify that too. So. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, Rick. 
along, yeah, yeah. along those yeah. same lines, I was going to ask if the so are the reports themselves submitted to you all. Uh, yes, they they would be. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if there's maybe it's not in the rules, maybe it's the program admin, but the sharing back out with any other, I don't know, like you said, industry partners. Um, I know there's um, other uh, report outs like the utilities get on like home energy scores and things like that, where we can engage and do follow up and see trends and kind of help be a supporting partner in some of those aspects. So I don't know if that's an area. Um, it's useful information for us as well for planning and knowing what customers are going to do to change their energy usage or what they could do. And so just mm -hmm. one, one idea of there's probably a lot of a lot of rules around the data sharing, but could be an opportunity. Right. Yeah, I, I, I do imagine that there might be some like some audits might contain confidential data and um, potentially things like that. That could be a challenge with making them publicly available. But yeah, it's a good. But then also you could, if you are getting them and have any sort of data tracking, um, you know, you could see that if there's an auditor who results in lots of exceptions and no projects going through, that could get flagged somehow, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The last thing you mentioned, uh, Rick, just um, is reminding me of an overall concern with the savings investment exception that um, implementing uh, compliance might be a challenge. So if, if, if Odo, let, let's just say that folks realize like, oh, this is the best path forward because one, you get an energy audit, but two, you might find a um, the most cost-effective pathway and that's why it's helped set up this way to comply um, that may or may not reduce an EUI. Uh, and uh, how how would Odo know, let, let's just assume like 100% of folks choose this pathway, this exception, right? Because there's nothing stopping that as far as I can tell. And so how would Odo assure that um, the goals of the policy are being met if the result is they have this audit and here's here's the recommendations come out of it and then I will implement that in some amount of time. It would be like reviewing back toward the EUIs later, but they still eventually need to come back to the EUI or is it just pretty much like as long as you get the audit and you get the recommendations and find out your own timeline to implement, then you're good to go from here until Whenever. I mean, it just seems like it's a very, e it's the, by far the easiest pathway forward that might not get the results that the legislation is intending. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's our concern too. That that you know, I you know, audits, could, commercial building audits aren't necessarily cheap um, to do, but you know, it, in some cases, that might be like the, the the cheapest pathway to hire somebody to do an audit. Um, and you know, document that there aren't any cost-effective measures that can be implemented, and then they submit through the investment criteria, and um, you know that becomes their compliance pathway at least for that cycle. Um, uh, you know, that's our concern too. That if you know a hundred percent or a significant percentage of the building owners choose that were to choose that pathway, then we wouldn't actually see any EUI reductions as a result of it. Um, you know, I think we'd have a hard time believing that there aren't any cost effective efficiency measures out there. Um, but, um, you know, it's, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what else to say other than that's, it's a concern that we have as well in terms of like how to verify, how to verify that and not achieving the, what we think are going to be the benefits of uh, the BPS program and reduce energy usage. So. Or, or they're implemented in a way that's not really making much of a difference. Um, so I'd be curious to hear from others who are maybe closer to energy audits and um, any ideas on how to enforce that the energy audits actually result in, in measures that are reducing um, energy use or at least improving energy efficiency. Because I know that, of course, within like when people are doing it voluntarily, their their intention, they already have like a reason to go and, and you know, whether it's carbon emissions or to look better for our energy star scores within the market 
or to reduce en their own energy bills. Like they have their reasons, but then when it's mandated as a government kind of, you have to do this, I, I, I have less confidence, I guess, that, that um, the end result will be achieved. Yeah, thanks for the comments, Vin. I don't know if anyone else has any other follow-ups or insights there. But it's it's definitely something that as program implementation occurs that we'll be you know keeping and uh, doing our best to keep an eye on um, like what percentage of the buildings are are you know going using the investment criteria pathway and you know doing an audit and of those, you know, how many are documenting lots of good energy efficiency cost effective measures and how many are just coming up with little or no cost effective measures and, and using that as the as the compliance pathway. Um, we'll definitely be wash, you know, it's something that we've heard about as concern in, in the other jurisdictions, the VPS too. And we'll, as those jurisdictions come into compliance, as their compliance timelines kick in, we'll be interested in kind of watching what what happens there. Um, too. I, one more thought on this, Blake, from me, Clark, um, yeah. is that I just think this idea of a credible threat of an audit of the audit, especially if it's potentially, it could either by Odo or by one of their industry peers, because my experience mm -hmm. is, is that industry peers don't like to, um, <laughs> they don't like to have their other industry peers tell them that they made mistakes. And so if you really believe there's a credible chance that the work you're doing is going to get reviewed by either Odo directly or one of your peers, um, you're probably going to sharpen your pencil and do a job that can survive that audit. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, whether you use the USGBC's model or the IRS's model, it just seems like the key is it has to be a credible threat. So a few people do need to get audited every year to make sure everyone knows that's actually happening. But it wouldn't necessarily have to be a lot, it seems like. Yeah. And Clark, do you think that could be achieved just by adding some language into the, like the audit chapters that just points to like the potential for Odo to audit the submittals I don't, that we I don't receive? Think, I think the word potential would not, I think not it, be needs, it would be helpful to say, uh, you know, a certain number and it could be a pretty small percentage it seems like you could do some research mm -hmm. but you know whether it's one percent or but some number of submissions every year will be audited either by odo or a trained certified auditor certified by the program right um yeah and that and that will it seems like if you use the language that will happen that to me would create a lot more um, clarity mm -hmm. for people in terms of as they're making their calculus <laughs> decision here. Yeah. As opposed to the potential of. That's my opinion. What do others think? Yeah, I mean, I do see some, um, you know, someone made a comment about adding language, say there's potential audit for submissions that, if, um, and then Montgomery County, Maryland is reserved the right to reject audits, life cycle cost analysis. Um, so that might be something that we could look, look at too. Um, yeah, I mean, you could certainly add it to the rules, Blake, and you could also yeah. put it on any of the forms that you're using or, you know, website information or, you know, if, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that could be useful to look at. In thinking about this as like five year kind of time frames, right? So um, if there were, in addition to the audit itself, if there's an indication that a certain number or percentage will be um, that ODA will spend uh, part of their resources to assure that um, that the uh, the the measures are you know, meeting the criteria within the administrative rules. So, like as you mentioned, Clark, like audit of the audit, 
And then on top of that, to have a revisiting, like uh, the same thing, like and then every year, another 10% will be reviewed to assure that the, there's actually implementation. And I think that's the part that I'm kind of wondering most, mostly about is, one is the, it's the quality of the initial audit, but then there's also what's the follow-up for implementation if there's kind of a pass on EUI. Or am I missing something here that there's actually a, a confirmation method to assure that measures are implemented in a timely manner? Um, well, I mean, I think the, I mean, it's probably would be part of their implementation plan, like their energy management plan, but I mean, they could still delay it, like for the, to the point of, um, like equip at the end of equipment's useful life. Um, if it doesn't line up, and, but I mean, one, one feedback loop would be the next time that they come to report their, like their energy use. We could see like if they were supposed to have done an audit that was going to save X amount of energy, um, it and they identified some cost effective measures in there. It should be reflected in their next, um, you know, in their in their gradual successive years of energy consumption. So that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I did have one. Oh, just a um, clerk. I, I I love the idea of committing Odo to uh, to reviewing either Odo or, you know, contracting out with a third party to review audits. My only concern there is just, um, like, uh, dedicating a budget to something that we don't have the budget for yet. You know, I'd love to include it in, in the rulemaking, um, but if it's not something that, like, we're certain of is going to be in our future budgets, then we're kind of tying our own hands there in, in some ways. Um, Understood, so, and, and yeah. I think you can just work with DOJ on the best language around yeah. potential or uh, whatever was in the chat before about the uh, reserving the right, just, just yeah, making that. it as as strong as possible. Just you know, contingent on on us having the resources to do it for sure. Because I think you know, in an ideal world, we want to we def that's something we definitely want to do. Agreed. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think we're right at about time. Um, so we you know, I, I kind of expected that we might not get to the final two items that were really just for. There's no draft language around them yet. It was really just kind of tee up the discussion around utility data aggregation um, and then a little bit more discussion around this campus buildings piece. So um, one thing that I'll do, we'll, we'll move these over to the next agenda. Um, one thing that I'll do is send out some um, materials for the rack in the meantime to start to talk about this, but just to mention it real quick um, about the utility data aggregation piece. So the, um, the, the law, the 3409 does give us the ability to, um, you know, one thing we may as part of these rules require utilities, eligible building owners and other entities to aggregate data for covered commercial buildings that have multiple meters. Um, so what, one thing that we're interested in is, um, you know, what level should be included in our rules as part of this effort to address this, you know, are additional state rules required? If so, what level of detail? We know that some processes already exist with some utilities to aggregate data, um, particularly in like um, in Portland where they've had a benchmarking ordinance for some time. Um, some utilities can um, are better equipped and better set up to aggregate the data than others. So we're uh, really interested in hearing, particularly from utilities and then building owners too. Um, you know what else would be helpful to get help make sure that a building owner who needs to report their energy usage has that usage available to them um, and kind of a who does what as part of that process for these buildings with multiple meters. So something to kind of think about, um, we'll send some materials out um, for that. And then also a little bit more on the campus buildings piece. Um, and with that, thanks everybody for um, attending today. Look forward to our meeting um, in July. In the meantime, let me know if you have any questions or comments on anything. Um, and I'm happy to stick around for a little bit here too, if there, if there are any comments, but I want to be respectful of folks' time, recognizing that it's 3 o'clock. So, thanks, everybody. Blake, it's Clark. Um, yeah. It's okay. I'll just call you because I missed the first um, 
hour, but I actually heard almost all of it. And I just wanted to talk through a couple of those connected building things with you, but I don't want to take everyone's yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Maybe you give me like five minutes or so and then. Um, um, sure. Or you can well, call me some other time too. We can set up another call if you'd like. Yeah. Um, no, actually, if, it, if five minutes works for you, that works for me because it, it'll only take five, five minutes or less. Sure. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, Mike. Thanks everybody. So Abby, I assume you will be able to give like the um and I also the the chat log. Yeah, that would be helpful. Um and then the meeting recording too. I know that takes a while to process, but yeah. You, um when that comes up, that would be great. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and I guess right. log off. Looks like uh, okay. just everyone's logged off here. Yep. Um, all right. Thanks. Okay. Wendy, thanks, Abby. Yep. Thanks.